بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After the assassination of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an, we come to the lesson and the lessons that we can understand from the events that followed. The people who were with Ali radiallahu an pledged allegiance to Al-Hasan ibn Ali. Who is Al-Hasan ibn Ali? The grandson of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one of the two sons of Ali radiallahu an from Fatima radiallahu anha, the one about whom the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam picked him up and put him on the mimbar and said, Indeed, this grandson of mine is a Sayyid. Inna ibn hadha Sayyid. Indeed, this son of mine, i.e. this grandson of mine, is a Sayyid. And a Sayyid is the one who is the leader or a commander or someone of a high status. He will make peace between two great warring factions of the believers. Two great factions, two great groups of the believers. And the Prophet ﷺ called them both believers. And he said that Al-Hasan will make peace. And the people pledged allegiance, people of Kufa, the people of Al-Iraq, to Al-Hasan after Ali radiallahu anhu. Muawiyah was still in Syria and of course in Egypt with his army and the situation hadn't been solved but both Muawiyah radiallahu an and Al-Hasan radiallahu an saw this as an opportunity for reconciliation a final opportunity to gather the Muslims together under one leadership many of the issues are still there so how would Al-Hasan radiallahu an go about reconciling and bringing reconciliation it's this that we're going to talk about in this episode and inshallah try to take as many lessons from as we can. In Sahih al-Bukhari, Al-A'mash rahimahullah narrates, I asked Abu Wa'il, did you witness the battle of Siffin between Ali and Muawiyah? He said, yes. Then I heard Sahil ibn Hunayf say, O people, blame your personal opinions in your religion. No doubt I remember myself on that day that if I had the power to refuse the order of Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I would have refused it. We never put our swords on our shoulders to get involved in a situation that might have been horrible for us, but that situation brought us peace and victory, except for this situation at Siffin. Abu Wa'il said, I witnessed the battle of Siffin and how evil or how nasty Siffin was. Siffin was a horrible, horrible battle that had a huge weight upon the Muslims. It had a huge effect upon Muawiyah radiallahu an, had a huge effect upon Ali radiallahu an, and to some extent that was the reason why they had the arbitration and they made the agreement that Muawiyah would remain in command of the people of Asham and that Ali radiallahu an would remain in the command of the people of Iraq. No doubt, after the killing of Ali radiallahu an, the pressure was put on Al-Hasan to continue the same vein or the same approach that was done before. Perhaps even to take steps back from what Ali radiallahu an had done. We've heard in previous episodes how Al-Hasan used to advise his father Ali radiallahu an not to accept the Khilafah until all of the people had agreed that he used to try to work for unity amongst the Muslims. But of course, Ali radiallahu an rightly knew that unity has to come upon the Quran and the Sunnah, that it can't be the only thing that people bear in mind. 
But after the death of Ali radiallahu anh, there was an opportunity for Al Hassan to finally make peace. Al Hassan had a huge army in Kufa. It was a massive army, a big enough army to fight against Muawiyah if he wanted to fight. Amr ibn al As said to Muawiyah, I see battalions which will not turn back before killing their opponents. Muawiyah said, O oh Amr, if these kill those and those kill these, who will be left for the jobs of the public? Who will be left to protect the women and the children? Look at the understanding of Muawiyah radiallahu anh. Look at the wisdom of Muawiyah radiallahu anh. If we start a fight again with Al Hassan, like we fought against Ali, who is going to do the jobs of the people? Who is going to be left? Which Muslim is going to be left to teach the people Islam? Which Muslim is going to be left to collect the zakah? Which Muslim is going to be left to look after the matters of the Muslims? Who is going to be left for the women? Who is going to be left for the children? In other narrations, it's mentioned that the Persians are going to attack the people of Iraq and the Byzantines will attack the people of Syria. Muawiyah, like Ali radiallahu an, is becoming tired. Ali radiallahu an became tired. He passed away. And Muawiyah is also tired of the fighting. He sees the evil that the fighting is bringing. Who is going to be there for the women? Who is going to be there for the children? Then Muawiyah sent two men of Quraysh to Al Hassan radiallahu an. He said to them, Go to this man, Al Hassan, and negotiate peace with him and talk to him and appeal to him. So they went to Al Hassan and they talked and they appealed for him to accept peace. And Al Hassan said, We, the offspring of Abdul Muttalib, have got wealth and people have indulged in killing and corruption. Al Hassan is suggesting something. And I'm going to talk about what he's suggesting in a moment. Continuing on, they said to Al Hassan, Muawiyah offers you such and such and appeals to you and entreats you to accept the peace. Al Hassan said to them, But who will be responsible for what you say? Who's going to guarantee that you're not going to go back to Muawiyah and the people around Muawiyah are not going to convince him to go back on the deal? They said, We will take responsibility for it on their behalf. So Al Hassan concluded a peace treaty with Muawiyah. What did Al Hassan want? For himself, nothing. The children of Abdul Muttalib, the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Ali Bayt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had whatever they needed. But what about the rest of the people? Al Hassan, look at his fiqh, look at his understanding in the religion. Look at his fiqh and his understanding that he knew his people need something. He said, as for me, I can give up fighting today. I have everything that I need. Bani Abdul Muttalib, the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet Sallallahu the family of the Prophet Sallallahu they have what they need. But what about these people? What are they going to have? What am I going to turn around and say to them that is going to convince them to accept? How can I convince them to accept what terms I agree with you? So they concluded a treaty in which Muawiyah offered to pay a regular stipend, a regular amount to the soldiers that were under Al Hassan radiallahu anh. Not as a means of bribery, ya ikhwan, not as a means of corruption, as a means of bringing peace. These people were used to fighting, they were used to killing, they were used to corruption. Al Hassan knew the situation of the people. There were people in his father's army who were used to corruption. Everyone was used to killing and fighting. They needed to be some incentive for those people who were not firm upon the Sunnah, those people who were used to getting more booty and used to fighting and used to all of these rebellions to calm them down. And Muawiyah had conquered Egypt, had sent Amr ibn al-As again into Egypt to take control of Egypt and to make Egypt a part of the Syrian side of the empire. And so he had the kind of wealth that he could use to calm down the soldiers of Al-Hassan. And so they agreed terms by which Al-Hassan would give up his right to the Khilafah, he would agree that Muawiyah radiallahu an was the Khalifa, that Muawiyah would be instated as the Khalifa of all of the Muslims, and that a large amount of money would be paid by Muawiyah radiallahu an to the soldiers in order to give them some kind of reason to accept the deal and to calm down any chance of rebellion from happening.
This was all orchestrated by Al Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu anhuma, and it shows you his fiqh and his understanding and his knowledge of the religion. And there's a lesson in this for us, brothers and sisters the virtue of compromising and giving up your rights as long as it's not something in the deen. Al Hassan ibn Ali, radiallahu anhuma, had more right if he wanted to demand his right to the Khilafah. He had just as much or more right to demand that. But he realized that if I'm going to get peace to happen, if I'm going to actually make peace amongst the Muslims and I'm actually going to bring about peace, it can't be brought about by me claiming to be the Khalifa and Muawiyah claiming to be the Khalifa. It has to be brought about by reconciliation and somebody has to give up rights and that's the way that reconciliation and peace works if you want to make peace between your relatives that are fighting with each other you can't make peace and get them both to agree on the same terms they were before they had made the peace somebody has to compromise they're not compromising in the religion it's not haram for Muawiyah to be the Khalifa Nobody in any madhab or in any understanding of fiqh thinks that it's haram for Muawiyah to be the Khalifa. Muawiyah is from Quraysh, from the Sadat of Quraysh, from the leaders of Quraysh, from the noble families of Quraysh. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al Khilafah to Quraysh. The Khilafah is for Quraysh. There was no shari reason why Muawiyah shouldn't be the Khalifa. And Al Hassan knew this. And of course, Al Hassan could demand, and he had the right to demand. He is closer to the Prophet ﷺ than Muawiyah in lineage. He is the one who is chosen by the people who were with Ali radiallahu and the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. He has all the right to demand. But he knows that if he demands, it means the bloodshed of the Muslims. And Hassan gave up his right to be the leader and gave it to Muawiyah in order to make peace. And this is the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Indeed, this son of mine, a grandson of mine, is a Sayyid, he is a master, a leader, and he will make peace between two great factions of the Muslims. After the break, we're going to continue to talk about what happened as Muawiyah took over the leadership of the Muslims. Until then, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Where truth is hidden, misleading quotations create confusion. Where truth is hidden, Lack of knowledge and wisdom cause upheaval and commotion. Where truth is hidden, manipulate scriptures and twisted facts emerge. This very hidden truth creates false propaganda, mayhem, chaos, disorder, and turmoil in our lives and the world order. But is there anyone with courage and wisdom? What is the truth and who has the courage to expose it? Because it's your right to know the truth. Watch Truth Prevail and Lies Perish in Truth Exposed by Dr. Zakir Naik every Saturday to Thursday at 9 p.m. and repeat telecast at 7.30 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. The Prophet wasallam said, Each person's every joint must perform a charity. Purity is half of faith. Every day of our lives, every part of our body is owed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in worship. Every step you take towards the place of prayer is charity. Gratitude for our creation, gratitude for our health, gratitude for everything which we receive from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our daily requirement as Muslims. Watch Amar Amanet in Prophetic Hadith every Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Saudi Arabia and 4.30 p.m. UAE on Peace TV. Islam is easy to follow, easy to follow. Easy to follow. but many of us complicate things 
to lack of knowledge. Of knowledge. Of knowledge. To clarify confusions about Islam. Join me on Umdat al Ahkam. Get the remedies of Sunnah and Zahi Hadith to protect ourselves from all kinds of innovations in Umdatul Ahkam. Next on Peace TV. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Brothers and sisters, welcome back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're talking about what came to be known as Amul Jama'ah. The year of unity, or the year of the gathering of all of the people behind one Khalifa, Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala an. Al-Hasan was praised by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for this very action that he took. Even though the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was not there at the time, 41 years after the Hijrah, 41 years after the Hijrah, 30 years after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and once again, in a situation not seen since the death of Uthman, the Muslims were united behind a single Khalifa, Muawiyah, no Abi Sufyan, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma. It shows you the knowledge of Muawiyah. Even though his people encouraged him to fight, even though it was said, now you have an opportunity to attack Al Hassan, now you have an opportunity to attack them and finish them off, it shows you the knowledge of Muawiyah shows you the knowledge of Al-Hasan above everything, that he knew how to achieve this peace and he did so. Shows you that a Muslim isn't bitten from the same hole twice. This is one of the major lessons we can learn. Sifin was a bloodbath. Companion after companion, pious person after pious person were killed in the battle of the camel, in the battle of Sifin. It's enough that in the battle of the camel, as Zubair, and Talha, two of the ten promised paradise, were killed. Sifin was described as such a day that had not been seen by the Muslims in terms of the slaughter and the severity of the battle. And we learn from this that a Muslim isn't bitten from the same hole twice. They learned their lesson from Sifin. They learned what had happened from Sifin. What happened was the decree of Allah. It happened, now let's learn from it. And this is an attitude Brothers and sisters, we all need to have. We've made our mistakes. We all have made our mistakes. Every single one of us has made our mistakes. But what will we be like if we don't learn from them? The Prophet ﷺ said that a believer isn't bitten, a Muslim isn't bitten from the same hole twice. You put your hand into a hole and you're bitten by a snake or stung by a scorpion. You don't take your hand and put that same hand into the same hole again. They learned their lessons. This is a major thing to benefit from this year when Allah brought this peace about amongst the believers. Note that the Prophet ﷺ called both groups Muslim. He said two great groups of the Muslims. Remember in Surah Al-Hujurat, when Allah says, if two groups of the believers were in ta'ifatani min al qtatalu, if two groups of the believers fight against each other, Remember what Allah Azza wa Jal said in Surah Al-Hujurat about those two groups of the believers. فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَهُمَا Make peace between them. Remember what Allah Azza wa Jal said in the Qur'an. وَالصُّلْحُ خَيْرُ Making peace is a good thing. This is something that was beloved to all of the Muslims and it brought about a great deal of good for the Muslims at that time. The battles against the non-Muslim armies who wanted to stop Islam and wanted to extinguish the light of Allah resumed again. Muawiyah was a noble companion of the Messenger of Allah and the Prophet ﷺ made dua for Allah to guide Muawiyah and people to be guided through Muawiyah. The Prophet ﷺ entrusted Muawiyah to write the words of the Quran for him. And if he could be entrusted with the words of the Quran, then he could be entrusted with the affairs of the Muslims. The Muslims united. But the reason why why wasn't the Khilafah of Muawiyah Khilafah Rashida? Why wasn't the Khilafah of Muawiyah that noble time that was the same like Ali and the same like Umar and the same like Uthman, the same like Abu Bakr? Why wasn't it like that? Because the situation had changed. Muawiyah himself had seen the bloodshed and he didn't want to get bitten from the same hole twice. 
and he became of the opinion and this wasn't correct and this was something that was rejected by the companions but he became of the opinion that the only way to stop the bloodshed was for him to appoint the next Khalifa and indeed to appoint people from his family this wasn't a matter of Muawiyah seeking fame for his family but that the people he was suggesting and we're going to hear about this in the next episode Yazid was a person who was well known in fighting he was a well recognized battle commander he was well known for his fighting for the sake of Allah he was well known for his family being a family of leadership and this was what Muawiyah radiallahu an came to the conclusion was the best thing to do Muawiyah overlooked those companions radiallahu anhum who were far more deserving among them Abdullah ibn Zubair among them Abdullah ibn Umar who were far more deserving of the Khilafah than the one that Muawiyah chose but you have to also understand like we've said again and again and again the Muslims did not make these decisions the Sahaba did not make these decisions out of an attempt to undermine Islam but it was out of an attempt to avoid bloodshed and again it was the wrong decision it was the wrong decision to make and it brought about a great loss for the Muslims and a great difficulty for the Muslims which we're going to hear about and the rebellions began again so during the Khilafah of Muawiyah it was a time of a chance for the Muslims to expand for the Muslim Empire Muawiyah took part in a number of raids against and a number of battles for the 20 or so years that he reigned for radiallahu an he took part in those battles he placed worthy commanders in charge of them the muslims were united the situation was somewhat better but it wasn't like the time of ali radiallahu an it was a time when the rulership sought to be away from the people a little bit when you started to see people entrapped or people enjoying the luxuries of rulership and being less concerned over those people who they were ruling over and again this wasn't so much during the time of Muawiyah radiallahu an as it was in the time that came after but it started to resemble a kingship and that was one of the things that the other companions the noble companions like Abdullah ibn Umar spoke against and criticized Muawiyah radiallahu anhu for that why have you made this Khilafah of ours into an issue of kingship where it just gets passed down to the son and the son of the son and the son of the son and the cousin and so on and so forth all the way down the lineage and of course Muawiyah did so to try to avoid the trials and tribulations that had happened previously during the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu an, the Muslims were able to lay siege to Constantinople or many of the battles that were fought during the time of Muawiyah radiallahu an, a number of them were led by his son Yazid who was a very great warrior the Muslims were not able to conquer Constantinople at that time and they were pushed back but they were able to move against a number of different cities and a number of battles to expand the empire brothers and sisters as we come to the conclusion of this period in time the last of the companions to rule over the Muslims and the beginning of this kingship that followed all the way through the history of Islam we need to understand some lessons and some very valuable things that we take from this time we need to understand that whatever we think about the kingship that happened doesn't detract from the status of the companions those companions who all agreed upon Muawiyah radiallahu an as the Khalifa remember their disagreement was with him choosing his son Yazid at the end and their disagreement was not over him because they united behind him with the treaty of Al Hassan and the Am al Jama'a that year when the people came together under one leadership it shows you the virtue of unity it shows you the virtue of making peace but the unity has to be based upon truth and justice you can't have unity where everyone believes in different things unity has to be on a common goal it shows that whenever the Muslims are split as Allah tells us in the Quran they will weaken and they will not be able to proceed forward and that at least 
with the Khilafah of Muawiyah, some of the conquests started up again. Shows you the importance and the knowledge of those Sahaba, those companions who were around at the time, particularly Abdullah ibn Umar, radiallahu anhumah, who time and time again showed himself to have the wisdom and the knowledge that would have made him far more deserving of the Khilafah than Yazid who came after him. Shows us the valuable lessons that we can learn by looking at history. We can't cover every single thing. We can pick up some lessons that are critical for us as Muslims to understand. For us to be able not to make the same mistakes again. For us in our own families, let alone on a political or a world level, for us to do things, but even amongst our families, for us to be able to make peace, for us to be able to try to find ways to accommodate, for us to give up some of our rights, for us to take a lesson in what happened when people do disagree, and for us to always strive to do the thing that is right in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. These are just a few things that we can mention. In the next episode, we're going to see the transfer of power to Yazid and the killing of the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ, al Hussein ibn Ali radiallahu anhumah, and how that reign of Yazid was so tarred by big events in which many of the companions were sadly killed and the situation turned bad once again. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yeah. <laughs>